This bird is a red warbler, which is found in the highlands of Mexico. And what I want to show you is what else was on that checklist. Those birds might look a little more familiar. Columbia's vireo, down there Bullock's oriole, black-headed grosbeak. Next picture, I tend to want to ask a question about. Uh, we'll have to do it rhetorically because we're on Zoom, but I always ask what kind of bird is this? And I know some of you will recognize it rather quickly as a Swainson's thrush. Well, my next question would be is where do you find them? Well, uh, you may be familiar, I'll just swing it by here, but some uh, Roaring Fork Audubon has a couple members, Rebecca Weiss, Mark Fuller, they've written a nice book called uh, Birds of the Aspen and Roaring Fork Valley. And they note that the Swainson's thrush is found in damp wooded habitat of montane forest. But if you stop me and said, just sort of out of the blue, Nick, where have you seen the most Swainson's thrushes in the last uh, 10 or 20 years? And I would tell you, I've seen them in yards, city parks, coffee farms, and rainforest. That's because I've seen most of them in the tropics. I've seen most of them in their winter. And I want you to be thinking about this. It's a theme I'll come back to over and over is what exactly constitutes a tropical bird. I've called my, my presentation, There Are No Boundaries for Wildlife, Saving Tropical Birds in Pikes Peaks Region. Now, I know a lot of this is going to be familiar information to you. And if that's what it is, well, that's OK. But maybe I could get you a little more fired up than you uh, maybe were before I started. So are these birds tropical or North American? Look at the Swainson's thrush. Uh, where I took this data is from eBird uh, sightings uh, for North America. And they don't always add up to 12 because sometimes there were some, uh, 12 months that is, because sometimes there was some overlap among, uh, say for example, the adults may leave earlier or arrive earlier. But by and large, you see all those familiar birds there on the left side of the page all spend more time in the tropics. So I'm not sure where we get off calling them North American birds. In fact, what I like to say is, is that they're tropical birds and they come up here for a uh, romantic vacation. Again, let's look at the links between the two. You know, there are species that are found here that are found there uh, that are, are sedentary. American Dipper, hairy woodpecker is another. That picture of the hairy woodpecker is from the cloud forest in Costa Rica. Then there are families that may sound unfamiliar, like a barbet or a honey creeper. And then there are ones of the same families that we have up here, but they look quite different. Uh, we have one silky flycatcher in North America, that's the Panapepla in the Southwest deserts. And of course, we're all familiar with a number of buntings. This is the rose belly bunting of Southern Mexico. So there's a lot of things you can think about there, links, things that sound the same, things that sound different. Here's a picture I like to show, and I think this one, um, really points out a lot of what I'm trying to get to just really be part of your DNA. The bird on the left is a calliope hummingbird. And the bird on the right is a bumblebee hummingbird. Uh, these two birds were caught in the same nest net. I was with a group with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies and we were in, in the highlands in, in southern Mexico. And the depending upon which source you use, this is the number two and number three smallest birds in the world. The calliope is the longest, smallest long distance migrant, but the bumblebee hummingbird is sedentary. Yet for a good half of the year, they live in the same habitat. I find those kind of things fascinating just because I'm interested in birds, but it also shows the kind of links we have. If you do anything that might help a bumblebee hummingbird on its habitat, you're also helping a calliope hummingbird. Well, there's lots of bad news. I'm going to go through some of that. Some of this you've heard before, some of it may be a little different. Um, again, you know about the three billion birds that are missing. You know about the how many birds need conservation action. You know all that. It's, we've been hearing it in the news and so on. Let's look at some real numbers and try to make some of this maybe more personal. Um, barn swallow down about half. And I Pick this picture, tree swallows on purpose, because I've, I've started asking some of my friends, uh, some of them that are as old as I am, um, well, let's say you used to bird this riparian area down here uh, oh, 25 years ago. If you saw 10 yellow warblers in a day, and now you see six, would you notice? 
And I've had a lot of people tell me, well, you think about it, uh, maybe not, maybe not. So I don't know where this tree swallow flock, maybe it had 20 more birds in it 25 years ago, maybe it had twice as many 40 years ago. A lot of this stuff is happening kind of under our noses without us really having a good feel for how fast it's going. A lot of species aren't doing very well that are, are rather familiar to us and favorites. Broad-tailed hummingbirds down by about half. And of course, Ollie's sided flycatcher is a favorite because that's what bird call almost all of us know with the quick three beers and, and it being down that much is, is really uh, something I've noted quite a bit over on our side of the mountain and that it's just become hard to find. You can find them, but it used to be something you went out in the high wood, high forest and see it. And again, I'm just going to give you some more numbers just to just to keep working on uh, depressing everybody who's listening. Sage Thrasher down by about half. Uh, we used to have a large bank swallow colony over by Delta uh, a couple of years ago. They're gone. No, no why. Wilson's Warblers down 70%. Now I'll mention uh, mountain bluebirds again being down by about a quarter. But what's the problem? Well, habitat loss and habitat loss because of connectivity. You know, the first one's probably more subdivisions, development, whatever, but then we're also losing a lot of connectivity of habitat. I'll talk a little bit more about it. Climate, of course, is a problem. And then there's everything else. And, collisions, predation, whatever. It's a wonder birds have done as well as they have. And I'll mention a little bit about the December 22 date, uh, 2017, a little later. So what happened to things like always sighted flycatchers and of course, common nighthawks? You know, just a little anecdote, you know, we're known over here, at least we think we are a little bit for the Junior College World Series. And when I used to go to that 30, 40 years ago, the Nighthawks would fill the sky and now you don't see any. Uh, the first couple, I, I like to use also the idea about when I started college and that's kind of when a lot of the data collection I'm using started. So we're kind of looking at generational changes. 80% population loss is really big. And just to go down to look at the side here on the the one about insect populations, this is something that in my reading appears to be more important than maybe I originally recognized. And that's that extreme weather events can actually have more of effect uh, short term on insect populations than on birds. You know, we read in our birding literature about how mistiming of spring migration and insect hatch and all that is, is a concern. But if the insects aren't there because of a freak storm or whatever, well, that problem is, is exacerbated greatly. Okay, sage grouse, uh, we you may be, you know, we're almost like we're all tired of it. It's in the news all the time, all the effect, the effect it'll have on oil and gas and so on. And the, they're really, really affected by fragmentation. And the point I don't want you to forget about this bird, because it does relate to a few others, it relates to lots of them in the tropics, is it's not the kind of bird that's going to fly from uh, you know a couple hundred miles on one side of I-25 to a, a nice bit of habitat that's been restored on the other side. That's not the way it works. It's not going to recolonize. And so a lot of birds, as we split them up, you know, become more and more vulnerable. And then there's this. I call it the hanky-panky effect. Um, I, I recommend highly a couple of books by an ornithologist who works in the university in Canada. Her name is Bridget Stutchbury. And she's the one who pioneered a lot of this research. You know, originally, and I can remember this myself going back 30, 40 years ago, there was the idea of, well, how big a piece of habitat do we need to save? And people would think uh, originally that, well, if a bird needs an acre of habitat, if we save an acre, well, they may nest there. Well, in fact, they didn't. Formerly, it was thought, well, it's edge effects, predation, and so on. But what Stutchberry's research showed, and it's quite interesting to read about it. I mean, they did some painstaking stuff, climbing up and checking uh, eggs and nestlings and so on. And what they found, as I say there, is that neotropical migrants in particular are obsessed with extra fair sex. I know like uh, for many years, and now I know why, you've probably been out birding and you've seen one bird, two birds in a chase, and you think, oh, hopefully they'll land 
and I can get a look at them, but they don't land. Well, what's happening is, is one male's chasing another one out of the territory. But what we didn't know until a lot of this research was done is while that was going on, the female was off the other side of the territory, um, getting really comfortable with the, uh, another adjacent male. This is so much a part of their evolutionary history that in a sense, it's, it's a type of colony nesting. You, most, most of these birds will just not nest in an isolated territory. So if you don't have a big enough piece of property to have a bunch of territories, and for most birds, it's not known what is the right number, then uh, they're, they're not going to use it. So this is a, a big thing that really points to the fact that when we save patches of land, a lot of little patches just aren't gonna do enough for us. Uh, this is a picture from uh, southern Costa Rica, right near the Panamanian border, and it points out a number of the issues that we're going through. We have a couple of tractors here, and this is a, an area I visited many times and, and, and uh, really enjoyed. And what they've done in the lower part is they've drained a wetland and they're plowing it up for rice. And then in the middle distance, you may see what looks like a monoculture. It's probably not all that clear to you, but those are palm trees, those are oil palm, and that's quite a scourge. And again, it kind of gives you an idea of what's happening to a lot of the landscape. If you look down at the steep hillside, there's a lot of forest trees still there. But then if you look over at the extreme left where it flattens out, that's pasture. So a lot of times what happens is, is all you're having left in, in many areas down there is a steep hillside. But nevertheless, the the draining of wetlands, and of course, this is food, it's human food. Um, you know, population is obviously an impact. And then, of course, palm oil, which I'll talk about a little bit more. I have a friend down there as a birding guide. He actually did some of his early work for the Bird Conservancy, so he knows Colorado a bit, but he's lived down there for more than 20 years. And uh, just look at some of the highlights. This is a guy who really knows the birds there. He's, he, like I said, he makes his living as a guide. He says, we don't have a way to lower temperatures. We see and hear fewer birds and there, you know, the words ecosystem collapse, not just drought, prolonged, hot, dry weather. One of the things that I always wanna point out at this point is that, for example, I, I looked up the temperatures for Colorado Springs on January 20th. And the average is typically lows in the 20s, highs in the 40s. But you wouldn't have been shocked to wake up to several inches of snow, or maybe you'd had several inches of snow a couple of days before, it was five or 10 degrees. And you probably also wouldn't have been shocked if it was near 60. And I think the fact that we live in a temperate climate has allowed many North Americans to not really recognize how much climate is changing. But again, go to the Central Valley in Costa Rica, the high every day is between 77 and 81. So a little bit of a blip on that is, is an enormous change. And the other thing that they're seeing down there is, is that the rainfall amounts are, are not so much changing, but the pattern is a big rain and dry season, a couple of weeks of extra dry weather during the wet season. And when you have all those micro niches that species live in, that, that's just catastrophic. Um, here's a, a picture from a paper that was actually published a week before last. Um, ignore that letter there. I don't know how that still got there. Just try and put these pictures in your head. The bottom one is average conditions in the 70s and 80s. The middle one is 90s. And the top one is essentially what's happening now. Uh, this work was published by a man named Dan Jansen. If you know, don't know that name, he's kind of a grand old man of ecology in Costa Rica. And what he did, and it's a tremendously large project and listed lots of money and lots of people, is he's restored a large area of dry tropical forest. So the other thing to keep in mind as the clouds have decreased is that actually the plant cover and diversity has increased. So again, just quickly, the 1980s standard view, solid mass of clouds with a foggy dripping cloud forest. If you've ever been in that habitat, you know what I mean. By the mid 90s, smaller cloud layer. And, and they noticed at that point, lower epiphyte loads, lower stream flows. 
Today, there are days with no clouds at all. And when there is a heavy cloud layer, it's 100 to 500 meters high, higher. And again, these are people that have worked in the same biological station for more than 40 years. And they point out that they never you know, noticed ants. They didn't have ants before because the litter was so cold and wet. Now they have ants. Well, one of the things they've really looked at uh, over their whole time, and uh, they, they really have been more into insects and things, this particular research group than birds. This is 1984. And I almost hesitate to show the next slide. To me, it's heartbreaking. You look at this one, look at the diversity, look at the density, the mass. Then in 2019, under the exact conditions, same location, this is what they found. Let's let that sink in for a second. What a loss, what a loss of mass and biodiversity. That's gotta have effects all up and down the ecosystem. And remember this is, in this case, they know the problem is not habitat loss. This has to be climate. That's the only explanation they can, can come up with. I've seen some of this firsthand. This is on the Rio Napo River in Ecuador. And although this is one of those forests, uh, one of those street rivers that actually that goes up and down quite a bit during rainy season, if you look at these pilings, um, I, I don't know if my mouse is showing on this or not, but if you look at these pilings, it's, they're several meters above the water. They didn't have a mark for it. This was the lowest it had ever been as far as anyone who we talked to had, had ever seen. And I want you to keep in mind these banks here. That's uh, uh, something I'm gonna comment on. Another problem, a lot of it down there is driven by uh, fossil fuels. Fossil fuels population are behind almost all these issues. I, I spent some time there with the, actually the woman who was the, at least she was the wife of the chief of this tribe at the time. And she talked about all the problems they were having, loss of water quality, uh, people being um, uh, getting rashes, uh, less food. Uh, they talked about uh, one of these barges actually uh, swamping a dugout with a dugout canoe with a family in it, family all drowned. And now think back to those banks. What's going to happen with these big, big barges? You're going to get an outwash from those barges. It's going to hit the bottom of those banks and it causes a phenomena called mass wasting. It undercuts the banks, the banks fall in, and you've now made the river even wider, shallower and warmer. And that's gonna have its consequent effects on all the wildlife. And of course, there's the flip side. It also turned out, I mean, it's not like I'm in the tropics all the time. Uh, this time I was on the real Madre de Dios River and they were all calling this the storm of the generations that no one had ever seen, but this happened to be rain and a flood. Uh, it was so bad that the lodge we were at, the uh, workers there who were natives who lived there in the jungle, they'd actually gotten out of the building and went under it and held on to pilings because they were so afraid. And actually all kinds of large trees had fallen. It had knocked out a couple of their buildings, wrecked their trail system, and, and it was interesting, you're talking to people who had never left Amazonia and, uh, you know, with maybe through the guide we had and so on, they all knew about the United States and its carbon emissions and fossil fuels. So, you know, we aren't, weren't making a great name for ourselves. But anyway, that was a flood. Now, what I'm showing you here is, is obviously not the lodge we stayed at. That's a gold dredge. Legal gold mining is, is a horrible problem down there. And, you know, I'm, I'm leading up to all these things that little things that all of us can do. Um, these dredges are illegal, but they're sort of either tolerated or they can't keep up with them or whatever. And if you know how a dredge works, it's taking up the bottom, sucking up the sediment, running it through a dredge and dumping it back out. So they're horrible on water quality. Here's another one and also in changing the, the substrate. Uh, here's a picture. We flew out over this river system when we left, and this is the pristine part. And there's the gold mining part. Look at that. I mean, it's complete devastation. Uh, it's a long time till some of that's going to come back. I found this article then about a year or so ago that the drug cartels in Colombia make more money through illegal gold mining. Now, depending upon the data you look at, 
uh, or whose source, somewhere around 50 to 80 percent of this gold is essentially used for cheap jewelry. Now, I know this is probably isn't the audience that's out there buying lots of fancy baubles, but even if you buy a pendant for your granddaughter or whatever, buy something else. You know, there's gold that we do need for some high tech devices and so on commercially, but you know, we can do things ourselves and not support this. It's very difficult not to if you buy gold. Okay, where are we? You know, I gave you a lot of bad numbers before and uh, I've let those sink in and I'll give you some more. Uh, the American Bird Conservancy's magazine called Bird Conservation, this is their winter 2019-2020 uh, issue. And they had a article that was entitled Apocalypse, No, Troubling, Yes. And they had this table in there, bird species showing greatest declines. Uh, I, I hope you're like me and seeing a lot of evening gross beaks because there's been an eruption this year, but 90% uh, loss. Black swift, some of you probably come over this way to see those down 90%. Aforementioned bank swallow, a number of birds. And these are found all over the United States, but also at the bottom made the top 20s, a lark bunny, our own state bird down about 77%. Well, I was frankly troubled by the title of the article, Apocalypse No, the troubling yes. So I sort of ask, what's your version of apocalypse? I went to the Cornell All About Birds website and collected a bunch of data on birds. And I was sort of focused more on, on, on my area and some of uh, other birds in the state. And in many cases, they provide the data as uh, how much of the decrease is annual, as opposed to what I think fear some of us may think is that there's been some event and all of a sudden 50% of the birds went away one year. But most of these birds are from the data from breeding bird surveys and so on are in slow decline. So I had made this curve, you have one and a half percent in the blue line, two and a half in the red and three and a half in the green. And you can look at the, some of the birds yourselves down there, uh, the lark buntings on that green line. Uh, I also like to point out that sage grouse gets all this publicity, but it's right down there with uh, olive sided flycatcher, pinion jay, plumbius vireo, and so on. And just to make the curve a little more uh, clear, the, the zero point is 1970. That's the data point that they used to start with. So 50 years is only about halfway out. So if you, you see that that would kind of make sense. I talked about a 50% loss. So here we are, blue line about halfway across. But these lines are, are, are uh, you know, we haven't done anything to change anything. So you may as well extrapolate them and see where they go. Well, you know where they're going. And in fact, a lot of these birds, as I pointed out, are, are communal nesters. And so we don't know where the zero point is, but it's probably a good bit uh, above zero. So I don't know what word will motivate you. You know, there's the, it's been said that if we, if we sound too desperate, that things are too terrible, that people will just give up and not do anything. So, okay, then it's just troubling. But if feeling that we're really in an apocalypse will get you to move, well, I think that's where, then use that word. But somewhere along this curve it is troubling to apocalypse and uh, you can decide where that is, but we, we haven't done anything to change what's happening. So until we do, um, you know, you can see the extrapolation goes where it goes, goes to zero. Why should you care? Well, uh, this slide is maybe less for birders, more for some other people. Uh, we spend over $40 billion, so we're an economic driver. Um, you know about chicken tours. Uh, people come to Colorado from all over the world. I've had people from as far away as Sweden come over to see me to see a Western screech owl. Then there's ecosystem services. Of course, I, I've thought twice about that slide after looking at that recent data on insects. Maybe there aren't as many insects to eat, but nonetheless, uh, our birds do a, a large service for us by eating things that are eating our plants. So we don't wanna lose that. And of course, recreation. Recreation's a, a big money driver in Colorado. Better habitat, the bigger habitat that's good for birds is good for recreation. 
This one on Lyme disease, uh, it, it, it's a speculation. There's absolutely no way to, to prove what I'm about to say. And maybe some of you have, have heard this story. And I will point out uh, Lyme disease has come up a bit lately as some have, have speculated as well that the reason Lyme disease has come to the fore in the last uh, oh, half century is that uh, people are living amidst wild habitats a lot more. But there's another story that people had put out uh, before COVID, which is actually what led to that recent uh, idea. But pre-COVID, uh, there were a number of people who said, why didn't we hear of Lyme disease? Well, like me, I'd never heard of it. And I'll bet most of you hadn't heard of it until 30, 40 years ago. So what happened? What's changed over maybe the last century? Well, what was the biggest consumer of acorns in the East and Northeast in the late 1800s? probably more 1860s, 70s. It was the passenger pigeon. And humans, not thinking about what they're doing, wiped out all the passenger pigeons. So all those acorns they ate went to the ground. What ate them on the ground is deer mice. And so the theory goes that perhaps deer mice have both proliferated and maybe exchanged their populations with more speed. And deer mice are a vector in the Lyme disease story. So maybe that's it, who knows? But it goes back to Aldo Leopold, who famously said, you know, if you're going to take something apart, you better save all the pieces. And well, when we wipe out a species, we don't know what we're doing. You know, again, we can't show this happened, but who knows? Okay, there are things we can do, and I'm not going to talk on this slide too much because I'm going to go through some, some specifics. You know, the first one about visiting, boosting economies. And I, if you're like me, one of your first thoughts, some of you out there would be thinking, what about carbon? What about fossil fuels? And that is a conundrum. It's something we have to work out personally. I think about it and kind of feel a little sheepish every time I get on a flight and go down to South America or, or Central America. But the truth is a lot of these places, if no one goes there to spend money, they're going to log them. Um, so you know that's something that you know we need to maybe we we have to push the envelope on uh, coming up with other transportation options and so on but a lot of those companies countries really do need uh, visitation one of the handouts is about appropriate environmental groups i'll talk a little about that later and most of you probably know some but if there's anyone out there who looks like gee where could i send money well i i did make some suggestions and i will point out um I feel like when I give a talk like this, that I will have absolutely fail if I hear that anybody who heard me talk still goes and buys coffee and brings it home that isn't bird friendly. I might give you a pass if you have to go into a coffee shop sometime and can't find it, but if you buy it for your own use and don't buy bird friendly coffee, well, I would say shame on you. Uh, Pete Mara, who was the uh, head of uh, the Smithsonian's migratory bird program, famously said the most important thing that North Americans could do for neotropical species. And again, when I say that, think about birds here and there. That's all those birds. Buy organic or shade grown, bird friendly coffee, whatever. And I have some options in my uh, handout. If you keep, but again, I think most of you probably know that, but if maybe you haven't been motivated, well, get motivated. That's what you need to do. I'll talk about these others as we go. Here's a shade coffee plantation where almost all the coffee that my family drinks comes from. This is uh, in Costa Rica. And again, you see the layers, uh, the nice layered habitat. And if you want to think about what a sun coffee plantation looks like, you could drive out far enough uh, east from you there and get to some soybean fields or something. Uh, tall soybeans, that's about, that's about how uh, bird friendly it is. This particular farm has around uh, a bird list, has a bird guide for, a, for an owner, but um, this particular farm has around 300 birds on its species list including this Lessons Mot Mot, which is easy to find a number of places, but I happen to take that photo uh, at this farm. And the other thing that I think I, I see, and I believe others have said this, is that if you bird on a coffee farm, they're actually used by more of the migrants, a larger percentage of the migrants like going to places like that. So drink a cup of coffee, save a swing some thrush. Okay, pineapple, why do I hate pineapple? This is Costa Rica, this is 
how you prepare to plant pineapple. You remove every bit of vegetation. And then the next thing you do is you lay down a series of plastic pipes to pump chemicals to the plants you're about to put in. And the cynics down there, and uh, of course I've become one, they say the next thing you do is you plant a bunch of tall shrubs around the outside so people can't look in and see how horrible it is. I've led a number of trips to Costa Rica and pretty much everybody <laughs> swears off uh, non-organic pineapple after seeing this. I haven't researched a lot. I don't know what all the other options are, but again, uh, this is multinational country companies come into a small country and, and uh, this, is, this is what's happening. Okay, oil palm. I have a presentation I do on oil palm and in that one I have some video and you just kind of sit for about three minutes as it, and it's like the scene never changes. The palm oil plants just go by and go by and go by and go by. And you probably know that this is a scourge. Um, and you probably don't know what to do about it. And we're all sort of in that same boat because this is used in so many products. But there are some things you can do and there are some things you can be aware of. Um, you know, problems in Asia are what get the most publicity. You may have seen the ones with the orangutans losing their habitat and so on. But just because the acreage is less doesn't mean the problem isn't just as bad in Central and in uh, South America. Uh, I have a, a film that I show with that presentation I referred to, which shows that the Colombian government for a while actually took indigenous people's lands, deforested them, and then leased them for palm oil. Um, one of our uh, famous, for many years, uh, birding spot in Costa Rica was El Tigre Marsh. And uh, it was drained you know, since I've been going down and replanted with oil palm. Um, some companies uh, you will see will actually say they've signed a def no deforestation pledge. Well, what about not draining wetlands? And of course, most of the time what they do now is they can just buy it from a third party who did the deforestation for them. Well, now it is deforested. Well, we can't avoid it, but we really can decrease our usage. You know, I looked at some products and I, I, because we're on Zoom, I can't show them too much here, but I had a, uh, I had a couple of granola bars and one of them, if you, you know, read the, there we are, if you read the ingredients in the back, you could see that it didn't have anything that said palm oil or palm kernel oil. Um, there did seem to be a little correlation. This might be good for your health wise too. A lot of things, this is a chips ahoy, there you see that? Cheez-Its, things like that. I got these from my grandkids, by the way. I don't use those. But anyway, you could see on those that those are high in palm oil. So you can buy products if you just take a second and look at ingredients and uh, maybe you should be doing that anyway. So you can, you can avoid it. The palm oil is mostly used for and to make things smooth and to not, so that they're not as crisp or whatever. We don't need them. Uh, maybe you can uh, make some of your own things. Uh, whoops, I didn't really want to go to that yet. I wanted to, to make uh, one more point about um, uh, palm oil is, is that uh, on my handout, there is a, an activist group and it's worth getting involved with that. You can learn even so you don't have to read ingredients. You can take a look, look at that and see what, um, what things have palm oil and what things don't. And it's also important for me to say that the studies I have read indicate that more indigenous, well, or more, I uh, don't have to be indigenous people, but more jobs per acre were provided by the original agriculture small farms and so on than by palm oil. So even though palm oil may bring more money into the country by leasing the land and so on, in terms of employment for these countries, it's a loss. So you don't have to feel like, oh gosh, we're, we're gonna put people out of work and, and not they won't have jobs. Uh, if we could go back to what was there before, there were actually more jobs, if, if not more uh, big money flowing. Okay. I had on my list of things you could do was to get involved with local conservation projects. And again, we're talking about how we're going to save birds. And here's a couple of interesting birds. Uh, you mentioned uh, that um, in your next project, our, our program, you're going to uh, draw some long-eared owls. There's a long-eared owl. And uh, if there's any botanists out there, a lot of times I like to have a guessing game of what that plant is that it's sitting in, and it's, it's in a tamarisk. 
Uh, my friend Kim Potter, if you know her from the rifle area, has done a lot of work with owls and she's helped us with our owl surveys for years. And um, she likes to say that uh, where you don't want to go, that's where the long-eared owl is. So when you wipe out tamarisk thickets, you wipe out long-eared owl habitat. This is an underside view of a cedar waxwing. You can see a little yellow tip there. And you can see some of the fruits. And these were was a big flock of them feeding away on uh, Russian olive berries, Russian olive fruits. So I want you to not equate non-native with nefarious. Now, don't go away from this saying, we had this speaker who said, tamarisk and Russian olive are just great and all that. Yes, if I could snap my fig fingers and trade these for cottonwoods and willows, I'd do it in a heartbeat. The problem is, and if you haven't seen this, get involved with your projects. What happens is, is there's all kinds of money for somebody to get six weeks worth of tens of thousands of dollars to move so many board feet of these nefarious invasive plants. And your habitat, which may have been a C plus habitat is now F. Uh, what we have over here, many of these places where they've done these projects, we end up with kochia, knapweed. Now we have no habitat. Some of this is really pretty good habitat. Uh, and and uh, as the saying goes, you can look it up, put it on the internet. It's not that hard to find papers that talk about the benefits that these plants provide. And again, compared to nothing, okay? And that's what too many uh, so-called restoration projects, they have money to do the destruction, but Restoration requires long-term funding, maybe not a lot of funding, but you might have to go back for 10 years to replant whatever. Tamarisk actually, is, as, you know, as I note there, retains 75% of the species. What the article goes on to say is the species that are missing are cavity nesters because tamarisk doesn't make good cavities. Of course, cottonwoods are wonderful for that. So obviously it's better habitat, but this isn't like it's worthless habitat. Another thing, um, Wood ducks. Uh, we had wood ducks that were in our Connected Lake State Park and was great fun at the right time of year to watch the to go along the ponds and the wood ducks would be under the edges of the uh, overhanging Russian olive and they'd be leaping up and getting those fruits. And yet I talked to a park manager, a CPW employee, and, and I honestly think he kind of had the sense that if a bird landed in tamarisk, it was like it was poisoned and dropped dead. I mean, it was like, oh, we have that, we got to kill it. Well, there needs to be a follow-up plan, and that's why they need folks like us to be involved and make sure that they're actually doing plantings and that they're going to take care of them. Okay, I had that sleepless the Friday before Christmas on my slide, and that that's really a true story. I, I can still remember it. I was sitting out here on my uh, couch, and I opened up my iPad and I saw that the Trump administration was going to gut the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Now, uh, I'll give you an update on where that is at the moment, but what this is, what the change that was like, and remember this act had been in force for about a century. So they went back over a hundred years of how this had been okay, apparently. And now all of a sudden it wasn't all right. And, and the change is akin to this. If somebody's out there sitting at home and they're downing a couple of fifths of whiskey while they're listening to me because they're depressed about bird populations falling, if you go out and drive and you hit somebody and kill them, well, you're going to be liable, at least for involuntary manslaughter or something like that. But when you got in the car, you didn't intend to hurt anybody. That's the way they have changed the Migratory Bird Act. You can do anything you want. If you know, if like, okay, you put out waste pits, whatever. So what if they're attracted to birds? My intent wasn't to kill them. So obviously, the leadership has to be changed, and, and at least personally, what a relief it is to guys. But that's only one part of it. I don't know how your county commission works, but like in our area, we are full-on county commissioners of drill, baby drill, and so on. They wrote letters in support of this change. So We've got to be involved. We need to let local leadership know about stuff like this too, because we, we care about it. Now, what's happened is, is, as I understand it, and there may be others out there who know it better, there was an immediate lawsuit after the initial announcement, which the good guys won, but the Trump administration ignored that. Ignored that. They went ahead and this month promulgated the final rule, 
which would codify or does this particular change. So now it's going to take lawsuits and all that to get it overturned. I suspect, um, well, as, as from what I understand, the Trump administration did not enforce the act anyway in the interim. So now, of course, they've codified it. It's going to take at least some time to get that turned around. And there's hope. Uh, I know a number of birding groups have, are hoping that there'll be legislation introduced to actually make the law very explicit. But anyway, this type of thing is really important. We have to stay involved in, in voting and being careful what our leadership is doing. OK, here's a term I don't really like, conservation dependent. Bluebirds, remember that slide where I said bluebirds are down 25%? We have some big nest box projects here, and I'll bet you do too. It's important, it's good, but how many species are we going to get to be conservation dependent and be able to keep up with it? That makes them vulnerable. Again, I probably personally didn't agree with taking Kirtland's warbler and black cap vireo off the endangered species list because they require constant human interdiction to maintain those populations. Black cap vireo habitat, if you know that down in Texas, is extremely patchy, cowbirds all over, and so the trapping will have to continue. Is that bird really safe? I don't know. It's something to think about. But as more and more things need conservation or are conservation dependence, that just makes the job harder to keep them around. Well, I have to end with good news because there is good news out there. And that's the kind of thing that needs to motivate us. This is a scarlet macaw, of course. And when I first saw these in the 1980s in Costa Rica, I described them as the living dead. You know, they live 50 to 70 years, reproduce very slow, and they were winking out. But with political will, they basically eliminated their illegal bird trade in scarlet macaws, and they also stopped deforestation in their best habitats, and they've rebounded well. They're easy to see now, and they're coming back. Now, unfortunately, there are some uh, less known birds, less known parrots that they aren't doing as good a job with, but it shows you get political will behind something like that, you can fix it. Another area I love, if you haven't been to the north coast of Colombia, next to Venezuela, Santa Marta area is, is amazing. The journal Science named it the most irreplaceable site on earth of all protected areas worldwide. Doesn't that raise a flag? What about the Galapagos? That's kind of what this is. This is a Galapagos on an isolated mountain range on the, on the northern tip of South America. Many endemic species. The bird on the left is the famed Santa Marta parakeet. It's uh, one of the best bird sightings I've ever had because there were only eight or 900 left when we were there four or five years ago. And we were told we were going to get up, we had to get up about four in the morning, drive in the dark. And if we got in this mountaintop, if we were lucky, three or four might fly over. Well, we had about 20% of the population landed right next to us. People were taking pictures with cell phones. I mean, the, guard, the guide was just beside himself. And it was so exciting. We got to watch them interact and copulate and fight and all this stuff. It was really a wonderful experience. And this bird, we also saw up there, Santa Marta brush finch. And I think you're starting to get the theme, Santa Marta parakeet, Santa Marta brush finch, Santa Marta ant pitta, Santa Marta, all kinds of things. Right now, they believe, I think there are 20 some established endemics there. And then the ornithologists believe there may be 40 to 50 endemics. But that land is saved. And how did it get saved? It got saved because of contributions, really, from North and South, North America, Europe, and so on. And this is a fairly recent success story. And it's, that's really exciting when we can do something like that. And here's something else. I just went through the bird list there today. Olive sided flycatchers spend the winter there. Also, both wood peewees, both wood peewees are also dropping in their population, eastern and western wood peewees. And, you know, when I looked at my own checklist and fit my memory, the bird that was on every checklist was a Canada warbler, one of our neotropics. So that's the tropical migrants. So that's perfect idea there is when you hear about some what may be obscure place, an obscure bird in Central and South America, if you want to save the olive flycatcher that sings in the nearby mountains by you, you need to save that place down there. You need to help. Yes, there are islands of habitat. Wish we could do better. And we have to have islands between here and there. As you know, they don't just transport that 
olive sided flycatcher down there in Santa Marta re region doesn't just uh, go into a transporter and end up in uh, Colorado. But um, these kinds of islands can do it. We've got to do it. Okay, and there are also unintended consequences with places. Uh, where I took those pictures of those hummingbirds, a few years after that reserve was formed for birds, they discovered Teosinte there, and maybe you've heard of it. This is the progenitor of all corn. At the time, they thought, gosh, if we had let this mountain be logged, we would never have known that this plant was there. Uh, the genetic diversity it, that we can lose by losing areas is, is potentially catastrophic. I think the plant's been found a few other places since then, but at the time it was the only known location. And that, what's this bird? This is a black cap vireo, that endangered bird that we need the cowbird trapping for. Where did we see this? We saw that in the highlands of Mexico. So it's all connected. It's all one thing. We can't talk about our birds anymore. Okay, we're not doomed. I, I kind of made this story up, but I also think it's true. The bird on the right is a Hokotoko ant pitta. It was discovered in 1997. And at that time, all people could see around there was everything being deforested. The guy on the left is a, a young guy named Diego, and he was my bird guide there for about uh, three years, and after, or three days, I'm sorry. And after I left, I, I kind of concocted the story, which again, I said, I believe to be true. So it's 1997, the whole, excuse me, the Hokotoko ant pit has been discovered. There, this is thought to be the only place it's found. They found it a little bit more now, but they still believe the total population is maybe only 600. This is the picture on the left is what most of the surroundings look like. Southern Ecuador is really, really grim, let me tell you. Look at landslides, snow trees, on the right, if you've been to the rainforest, cloud forest like this, you know, you can't really take a picture of it. It's all dripping and wet and green and lush. It's a gorgeous place. And again, a couple of birds that uh, spend time down there, things like Blackburnian warbler, uh, Swainson's thrush, our buddy is there, red-eyed vireo and so on. Okay, so we birded this reserve, it's called the Tapachlaka Reserve for a couple of days. And Diego suggested that we drive down the valley and see some other birds. Um, and there's an archaeological site there, which I took pictures of. And a couple of my coming photos are kind of fuzzy because I didn't know I was going to use them this way when I took them. But in any event, uh, there's an archaeological site there, which is believed to be the birthplace of cacao. So for all you, all of us, chocophiles, uh, that's an important area. And on the right here, this is, you see some of the old uh, construction from the archeological site and this middle building has, uh, has more protection for it. And there's a little pavilion down here. And what came out as we were talking is, is that uh, this is uh, Diego's hometown. It was like 20 miles down the hill from that reserve. A little closer look at that pavilion. And you can see there's a little poster on the side, which might start to look a little familiar. You look at the habitat here, there's actually a river going down below. And this is one of those steep hillsides that uh, people couldn't log or cut down to put uh, cows or corn on. And so there's a lot of birds there. And what's in that, now you see maybe a little more that those are actually birds. And what turned out is, is that uh, Diego was um, born in this town. And uh, the story that I tell is, is that about the time the Hokotoko ant pit uh, was discovered, he was probably 10 or 12. And so as he was coming of age, his uh, choices without the Hokotoko ant pit uh, were probably either to find a relative or maybe inherit a little bit of land and grow some corn and be a subsistence farmer, or maybe he'd have to move to Quito or one of the other larger cities to be a taxi driver. Instead, he got a job at the reserve. He's called a ranger. And what he does up there is fixes trails, buildings, whatever needs to be done. But he's one of the, maybe the smart guys. He, he doesn't, doesn't speak English, but he learned all the birds. And so when somebody shows up, um, like my wife and I, who know enough Spanish to get by, uh, we can hire him as a guide. So he gets to do some guiding too. And he bought a camera and, and these are mostly his pictures. He had this, somebody helped him get this poster made. And he went to his hometown, he got this pavilion built, bleachers in there. And you know that wouldn't have happened without the Hokotoko Ant Pitta and people like us that supported 
purchasing that reserve. And that's why uh, that's good news. Those are the kind of projects that we can all be part of. Uh, I, I talk about this particular group who, who did this work, but there are many around the world. We can do good things. We can save places like this. We can give people like Diego a completely alternate path and look at what they might bring back. Who knows, this is hopefully gonna inspire uh, maybe another child from this village to go into a real conservation career. As this is, as I mentioned, it's called the Hokotoko Foundation, but they actually are funded even through the American Bird Conservancy and so on. So I like to say the sunset of the Gulf of Dulce, this is the southern tip of Costa Rica looking like the Osa Peninsula is beautiful. And we can all work together and not let the sun set on our wildlife. So that concludes my presentation. I uh, would be really happy to answer any questions. Um, I do have a handout, which uh, this is like three parts there. And uh, uh, Anna Joy explained how you can look at that. And a little self, shameless self-promotion. I published a book in October, if you want to hear more of my thoughts. And I also do a blog. And I have there my contact info. And I am really happy to dialogue with people, give any advice. And I'm happy to learn things if you... Um, if I said something that piqued some of your interest or you want to tell me something you think I got wrong, I'd love to hear from you. So thanks very much for your attention. I hope uh, it was worth your while.